Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Premier Sports Network's online player care event. The subject up for discussion today is sport as a vehicle for social change. Now, what a year it's been. And I'm not talking about coronavirus. This was the year that we took the knee, we walked off, we fed school children and we spoke out. Sport has always had the potential to be a vehicle for social change. We've seen many hugely significant moments and movements throughout the years, but was or is 2020 the year that sport began to truly fulfill that potential? Can we go back to sport just being what we play on the pitches, the fields, the courts? And indeed, does anybody want us to do that? We have an opportunity today to discuss this and plenty more to share personal experience with our panel of guests. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with each other, but it'd be great if you could just introduce yourself first and give us a bit about why this topic is important for you. Susanna? I'm Susanna Townsend. I'm a current Great Britain international Olympic gold medalist. Um, was looking to retire in the summer and have had to find a, another gear to get to, to the next summer. But for me, it's been a long old journey in my career where I've seen lots of change and and I think for the first time, especially in the last couple of years, I've actually started to feel that change. And I think if I look at the future and, and the kids that are turning up to training at the moment, who are literally 19 and I'm 31, I, I hope that their experiences will turn into being something a little bit better than mine. Um, and that's all my motivation behind, behind who I am and what I'm trying to do. Elena, welcome. Yeah, I'm Eleanor Snowsill. Uh, I'm a Welsh rugby international and I also play for Bristol Bears. Um, for me, my full-time job is I work for a charity called School of Hard Knocks um, and I'm really fortunate to be working in schools across South Wales with children from disadvantaged backgrounds and, and for me there's so much talent there, um, unbelievable amount of talent and it's just about how do we bridge the gap between uh, the sort of the postcode lottery of, of where you grow up and, you know, who makes it internationally. So that's that's my big passion and why I'm here today, I guess. Leon, welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm um, Leon Mann. I'm the founder of the Football Blacklist and the Black Collective of Media and Sport, two initiatives which are essentially about addressing the underrepresentation of black people and more broadly diverse people, people who bring diversity to our industry um, and uh, yeah, I've worked as a broadcaster, um, I've worked as an anti-racism campaigner, um, I've seen the impact that athletes um, can make on society um, beyond the field um, and um, have encouraged many to, to do that. So uh, I'm really interested to, to listen to everybody and learn from everyone's experiences. Thank you, Leon and Anton. Hello everyone, I'm Anton Ferdinand, a formal, former professional football player. Um, I was involved in probably the biggest racial incident within our English game. Um, this year, it was nine years ago this year, I released a documentary called Anton Ferdinand Football Racism and Me um, and just looked at the ripple effects that I had on myself and and, and seeing who, who's accountable really for, for stuff that I went through um, on a daily basis uh, around the court case and around the incident um, and, and trying to highlight so people can see that there needs to be positive change, but also they can view and see that via watching me go through on a journey, because I didn't know what I was going through. So I'm going through a journey of myself, but for people to see it and go, do you know what? There needs to be change and there needs to be drastic change now. Welcome to everybody who's joined us as well. Um, I want to invite you, please do feel free to ask questions. Put it in the Q&A box, not the chat box. It'll get lost. I can't do more than one thing. Um, also to our guests, remember this is a discussion. So if there's something you want to say, please don't wait for me to ask you. Just crack on, talking of which. Uh, let's get started. I just want to ask more broadly speaking, sort of a bit of philosophy. When we talk about using sport as a vehicle for social change, how do each of you understand that? Does it come from the top, from individual players, grassroots clubs? What does it look like? Leon, can I go to you first? Yeah, I mean, um, for, for, for me, I guess the, the core principle is using the, the huge appeal um, of sport that we, we've all experienced and, and, and see day to day um, and using that beyond physical activity, um, using that to change society, to use the pull that sport has um, to share messages around um, the importance of challenging racism, for example, challenging homophobia, 
um, and, and other um, forms of discrimination in one case and, and, and encouraging other types of positive behavior in another way. We know that, you know, for particularly for young people, they're on a learning journey. So we have to capture them um, and um, engage them, um, not literally, <laughs> but in terms of um, putting positive messages around them um, while they're kind of engaged. Uh, and I think that's where sport has played a major role, will continue to do so, and where we can do even more good work in this area. Eleanor, I'll ask Eleanor instead. Eleanor, <laughs> when we talk of using sport as a vehicle for social change, how do you understand that? Where does it come from? What does it look like? For me, um, in my experience, sport can 100% change lives and it can save lives. Um, and I see that on a daily basis um, with the kids I work with. A lot of them are at a huge risk of exclusion um, and, you know, are fighting daily, get kicked out of their lessons. And suddenly you put a rugby ball in their hands and tell them you can smash people in front of you, you can tackle people, you can be really aggressive on the pitch and actually you're rewarded for it rather than... Um, you know, criticised for it, and and that you you just see that switch flick in in, the, in their minds, and all of a sudden they're you know they're sort of saving all their frustration and their energy for the rugby training sessions, for the matches, um, and and it's just a real outlet for them. Um, so for me, I think we just need we need more opportunities for people to find the sport that they love. You know. Um, I think there's still quite a limited curriculum in the schools of what we can offer and it all depends on which school you go to and which teacher there is, has a passion for a certain sport so if we can make it more varied and and give people more opportunity to try different sports um that's that's one way of trying to make sure everyone has the best opportunity i guess anton same question for you um yeah i believe that uh sport can can help society for for sure i think like the others have alluded to sports a major major tool to educate people in in different ways i mean i went to south africa when the the world cup was on and they were using football uh, football skills and dribbling with a football to teach kids how to uh, teach kids about um hiv and stuff like that just by doing um simple ball skills where they were dribbling around, dribbling around cones the cones was the virus and you wasn't allowed to touch them. The minute you touched a cone, you, um, you, you then had the virus. So for me, sports can be very, very influential in terms of um, educating people and educating the, the, the younger generation. But I think, and I'll speak for football because that's my background, until the organisations and the federations start to get in gear because you asked a question in terms of, of does it need to be down from the top? And I'm doing a, a governance course at the moment, um, a, a affected board members course at the moment. And one thing that it states in there is that, um, and they use that saying, a fish rots from the head down, not from the towel up. And that's how it needs to go. The federations are at the top, the organisations at the top, and still they, until they get themselves in gear and start dealing with these things appropriately, any form of dis discrimination uh, properly and appropriately, then we're going to be we're going to be found wanting and that's what i think i'm going to revisit that in in a short while but susanna anton talks there education key for impacting social change ending discrimination all sorts of things um but where do you think this happens coming from a hockey background it's i won't pretend to, to say that it isn't it isn't a high it isn't a privileged privileged sport where there's money involved where it's played in a lot of private schools and and actually, as a players group, and this is why I say from the top, where, we, where we're standing at the moment, we've had to act as a players group. And we've talked to our governing body, we've talked to, to hockey as a whole, and we've tried to figure out ways as to how we can make it more an a more inclusive environment for all. And, and actually, the power, the power of us as players having those discussions as a group, talking to our CEOs, going into clubs or talking to clubs, it's... It's something that we've really had to put our heads together and understand and and I think for, for a lot of us and I will openly say I've played with I played with one black player in my whole time as an international hockey player and you look at the stats and we've all looked at the stats and, it, and it's quite scary and and it's not going to be a quick change but if we're all educating ourselves which as a players group we all are and we're starting to actually question and challenge each other then gradually that can then be taken out into into the grassroots and and etc. But but hockey has quite a bit of a long way to go. And as a sport, we're very open as saying that. But 
but I'd like to think that at the moment, especially as players and the governing body, we're trying to do as much as we can. So in that regard, then, how powerful can sport be when there's huge changes that need to happen at societal level, in schools, just generally in the street? Leon? Yeah, I mean, look, sport, sport can absolutely lead the way. In many ways, it is. Should it have the responsibility to is another discussion and debate. Um, you know, maybe the failing... that's, a, that's a fair enough question to be asked here. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that the, the failings in um, society um, have heaped pressure on many sports people to to have to become in many ways activists, etc. Um, in response to their sports, in, to res in response to society, not dealing with things sufficiently. Um, you know, we've seen um, Raheem Sterling, um, you know, it was, it was almost two years ago, he put that Instagram post out about the difference in how um, he saw a, a black teammate and white teammate treated by the press. Um, before him, Jason Roberts was doing a lot of work 10, 15 years ago. Um, Anton's brother, Rio, has done um, a lot over the years. Um, many, many other sports stars um, have, have contributed heavily um, to trying to educate people um, through using their platforms. Um, and, and they will continue to, to do so as long as the pressure is there. But, you know, Anton used the word accountable earlier on um, in, the, in, the, in his introduction. And we can't move away from who is accountable for change within our sports. You know, those are the people who are paid a lot of money who sit at the top table um, within our sports and they are accountable. To my knowledge, nobody has been removed from their position because they have failed us as black people, as women, as LGBT people in the community. Um, so that says to me that the seriousness we're approaching many of these issues with isn't probably where it needs to be. And that is why in response to that, athletes are having to take their own action. Is that what you want to see, Leon? You want to see people removed? Well, I think if I'm paid a lot of money to do a job and I don't do it properly, if I can't protect my black um, athletes from turning up to work, then I should be sacked. Absolutely. If I don't make my film correctly, <laughs> because I'm in the filmmaking world at the moment, believe me, you know, there's going to be a consequence to that. So actually, what are the consequences in sport for not protecting our athletes? That, that's, that's a big question I think that needs to be answered. Well, there's a big point in what Leon's just said there, Anton, and after watching your documentary, I hope everyone has, it's well worth it. Um, it struck me, dare I say, I use the word hypocrisy, maybe, um, with regards to the FA. That's how it sort of came across to me, that while we have a lot of initiatives at the moment, and I'd love to get your thoughts on those, unless we do make change at the top, does it feel slightly plastic, for want of a better way of putting that? Yeah, I think definitely it, it does. And hypocrisy is probably the, the right word. Um, the FA and other organisations, they are doing great work, you know, on the ground. Are we far away from where we need to be? Of course we are, but we're doing great work. Some of it is, is box ticking exercises, exercises. Some of it is good. But then when you're, you're doing that and you're doing good work and then um, the chairman of the organisation comes out and disrespects a whole load of people um, in, the space, in the space of four or five minutes, you know there's a, a deep issue there's a deeper issue and all the work that they're doing it kind of get brushed it kind of gets brushed to the side you know and my thing is this at the top if the board members and the board should represent especially at the FA and we're talking about the FA here it should represent every age group within the England within within the English English setup you know every age group is diverse you know it isn't just a white footballing um, team it's diverse. So why is not the why is the board not at the top level like that? Why is it not representing what we see on the pitches? And I think when we get to that stage, and this is where sport and football can be a catalyst for change um, in society and in the business world, is we can be the first ones to have a, a proper diverse board, which will make corporate um, corporate and corporate organisations look at it and go, well, they've done it. We want to do what they're doing because. If you look at a lot of uh, financial stuff, when you look at um, the corporate world, the corporate world want to be doing what the Premier League stars are doing. Okay, the Premier League stars have invested in this. We want to invest in this. 
So it, it kind of goes with at the top as well. Okay, we've got a diverse board. They've got a diverse board. Board. That's what we need to do. So I think there's it can be a catalyst for it, but it's it's a bit deeper than than than, than what we're saying. Diversity matter. Wouldn't people just argue we we just got the best people for the job? Was that directed to me? Sorry, you can't. Susanna. Sorry, sorry, can you repeat it? Sorry, I, you Why out, does diversity it? matter so much? You say that some there's perhaps a lack of representation in, in hockey, but wh why should it matter? Especially if you're talking all the way up to the top. Some people will say, you know, you're just going for the best, most qualified people for the job, surely. For me, it's making, if I talk about it on athletes' terms, it's making it where everyone feels like they can first be themselves, be comfortable, and everything, their skill set, their colour, their sexual orientation, it doesn't matter. And I can only think of personal experiences to me. So going back to Leon's point, being in the public eye, I am 100% more gay as such and saying that I'm gay to the world because it helps people understand and, and it tells a story. Would I be like that if I wasn't in the public eye? Probably not. And an example I have is I actually about a month ago um, took the gay flag down from my Twitter only because I was getting really annoyed. I was like, why do I have to have a label on something? And, and then I spoke to a friend of mine who is an ex um, Australian footballer and she was like, Towner, keep it up because, because actually you're helping so many people. And I put it back up because it made me think, and this is, it's a really small story sort of about what's happening in diversity and people feeling how they can be themselves. But it's, if you look at diversity anywhere, it's pretty much people feeling comfortable in a situation. Hockey, for example, people maybe from any form of life don't feel comfortable in that situation and other sports, whether it's in a boardroom, whether it's on a pitch, it's all the same things. And I think making it a more inclusive environment where you can literally be yourself and is, is the aim. Have I always been myself? Probably not. Um, am I probably too far the other way now where I'm always myself and show everyone all of me? Yes. Would I like to find a way to come back a bit more in the middle? Definitely. And, and that's the struggle that I find as an athlete because I'm having to be a lot more open potentially than I necessarily want to be and exposing myself to, to more criticism, more praise, everything. And, and that makes it very difficult. Eleanor, I, I really am glad you pointed that out because I wanted to ask you the, the same question. It's, have you ever felt that pressure or responsibility to represent something a body as rather than just you you as an athlete yeah i totally get what um Susanna's going on about there um it's i got asked to do a sort of a, like coming out story a couple of years ago and i and i was like why do i need to do that like i'm just me everyone who knows me knows you know who i am and that sort of thing and then i heard before i said no to it i was going to say no to it and then my brother told me about one of his friends who still couldn't come out to his parents um you know, from quite a rural background and, um, you know, was, was worried that he was going to get kicked out if he did come out. And that then said to me, hang on a minute, this, there's still work to be done. So even though my experience might be fine and I have no issues myself, while there's still other people who have these issues who can't tell their parents or who can't be themselves, even if, you know, me sharing my story is just a little uh, sort of spark that someone needs to sort of you know, make that next step or to, to open up conversations, then it's still important to do. So you do have that extra little bit of pressure, but being, being in this sort of, you know, in the public eye is, is, a, is a privilege. Um, and it's something that you, it just comes as part and parcel of the job, I guess. But on the flip side of that, and, and Anton, I want to ask you about this because, you know, there were many troubling things in your documentary, but one of them uh, that stood out to me was the criticism that you received from from anti-racism bodies over, over your decision not to say anything. Now, is there too much pressure from some quarters for individual footballers, individual athletes to have to speak out, to themselves be this vehicle for social change that we talk about when actually some athletes aren't ready for that, don't feel mature enough? Do you think there's yeah. too much pressure? Um, I think people need to be comfortable to do what they want to do if they feel like they, they they're strong enough to speak out and they can speak out then great if they don't we have to respect that you know i think the message will get lost if they're not if they're not 100 percent in to talking out then the message will get lost because the message will be clouded it'll be different 
you know. But if you're if you want to speak out and the passion's there, then that message is more clearer and more powerful for me. It was a different time nine years ago. Nine years ago, the platform that I had then ain't the platform that I have today. It's it's different. We're living. It's a different world we're living in right now in terms of it's a social media um, driven world right now, whereas back then it wasn't. Um, but in answering your question with the anti racism body putting me under pressure, in the documentary, me reading that that article that Lord Usley done, Lord Lord Herman Usley done, that's the first time I'd read that. But what people didn't know was the, the the meetings that I'd had with them, Leon would know, but the meetings that I had with them, they knew that I couldn't speak. They knew I couldn't say anything because it was a criminal case, because I might have harmed a, a criminal uh, court case. But for them, for them to know that and still come out and say, if Anton don't speak, he's letting down the former black players who went before him. And I, I was like, wow, is that, even though you knew the reasons why I couldn't, and you didn't want to respect the fact that at times I felt like I, I couldn't either. I was scared to. I was scared to speak, not just because of my career, the, the whirlwind around it. My, my family were getting um, were getting pelters. The, the, the ripple effects around the social media abuse was, was something that a lot of people have never experienced. When you're opening your phone and, and every hour there's something new and there's there's a barrage of it. It's not one or two, there's a barrage of it. And we nearly, I nearly went back into that stage the week leading up to the documentary coming out where I started to suffer racial abuse again on social media, getting uh, banana emojis, monkey emojis and stuff. This was different because it was only from uh, one or two where I'm used to the masses. I was able to, to process it and deal with it. But before then, when it was barrage after barrage and there was loads coming through, it's hard to actually process. It's hard to take it in. And then when you do take that, you, when you are trying to take it in, it's like, okay, well, where does it go? If you don't feel supported, if you don't feel like there's uh, an out, where does all that feeling go? It stays in, which then, then can become very, very dangerous. Leon, social media, as, as Anton's pointed out, a force for good in a way. It means that everybody can share their messages to a wider audience uh, for the good, but also some, ob I mean, some awful, mm. awful comments. I don't know if Susanna or Eleanor, you've ever experienced a, a Twitter storm or had any kind of Twitter abuse. I have, it's, it's probably nothing like Anton, but it is horrendous. I mean, what role, I guess, do social media companies have, do you think, Leon? And the media, the wider media in general? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, um, in terms of social media, there's a, there's a huge opportunity now that we know of and have seen. You know, um, Raheem Sterling has probably changed the whole dynamic and discussion well he has within the sports media in this country um, by shining a light on the treatment of a black player and white player. Um, what that did is it caused a great deal of embarrassment and a, uh, an opportunity for reflection um, for the media. Now, the work that I've been doing has been talking to them for 10, 15 years about the lack of diversity. And we've made some good progress within that. Raheem Sterling gets on and pops out uh, an Instagram message that's leading the national agenda. And that allows me to be able to go in and say, right, the change I've been talking about, those things I've been asking you to do for 10 years, right, now you've got some pressure to actually get on and do them. So actually that's the good side of things. And, and that's great. The difficult side of things is everyone's just kind of exposed. You know, back in the day, if someone wanted to have an opinion on you as a sports person, maybe they'd come up to you in the street but probably wouldn't have the guts to say it. Now you can sit at home and just kind of message away and it can be kind of alerting you in your pocket and, you know, it's in front of your family. It's there for everyone to see. So, you know, social media companies are very good at locking down problems where it involves sports rights. You will not see Premier League action on any of those social media platforms without getting banned and shut down. So what people are asking and demanding now is the same from social media platforms to say, shut this down. But this all goes back to following the money. If we can influence the money, then things happen pretty quickly. What we've seen this week with players walking off the pitch together will impact the money, will impact the sponsors, will impact all the stakeholders in the game to cause the urgency needed to make change. And that's the big role that athletes play. Because without that, you've got campaigners knocking on the door saying, come on, here's a million things you can do to change it. We'll help you. And then they say, yep, yeah, that's great. And then it gets 
put on a, a pile of other problems on somebody's desk and it's just one other problem and it's not prioritized and it just gets left there. So actually by athletes using social media um, in the right way, um, if they are ready for it um, and feel passionate about it, um, can make a huge change. And as, as Anton's shown, because, you know, it, it, Anton's documentary, you know, I was very close to what was going on at the time. Um, as a journalist, you know, I'm very close to, to Anton's cousin, Max, who's a brilliant guy who featured in the documentary, and I was glad that he did. Um, so I saw a lot of what Anton was going through. Um, and Anton, I thought you were very hard on yourself because actually by coming out and not saying to people, you could have easily have come out and said, you know what, guys, this isn't a big deal. Let's just let's just leave this. Let's just. And that is what a lot of athletes have done. And I wouldn't even blame them for doing that, given what people go through. But Anton didn't do that. This was bigger than Anton. I think Anton always understood that. But it was just a complete mess in terms of how anybody would deal with this. A complete mess. Everyone messed up. Everyone. And the media, you know, also, you know, didn't um do their job sufficiently and for me that links back to well what is the diversity within the media what is the expertise within the media what is the diversity within the fa board to, for them to be able to have an understanding of how we move forward on these issues um, so it's all linked but it's all linked to the work and if the work's not done then the urgency comes from the athletes and it puts the pressure on them so let's get on with the work let's have someone who's accountable and let someone yeah, let's move forward with this I'm going to get the views of Susanna and Eleanor, but I want Anton, if you want to respond to what Leon's just said. Yeah, um, I'm glad that you've alluded and said that um, I, I knew back then that it was bigger than me. I think a lot of people think that I just think now, I, I think uh, with what's going on in society and stuff, it's now the, the incident, uh, what's going on is bigger than the incident. I've always felt there's a bigger picture to the incident from the get-go, that's always been there. It's just, um, and I, it's just that I see, and I've seen podcasts, I've seen other people debating the, the debating my uh, documentary. And if you are gonna debate it, you have a responsibility to debate it properly because this issue is, is very, very big. This, this topic of conversation is very, very important. So if you are gonna debate and speak out about it and speak your thoughts on it, make sure that the facts are with it because I've seen people say, um, I'm only doing this because of society, because of society and, and because of what happened in America with George Floyd. But this was uh, something that I had done and something that I was, I was approached with over two years ago before anyone knew who George Floyd was, you know? And, and I think when you are gonna talk about something that's so um, important in terms of the topic of discussion, I think if you, you have a duty and a responsibility to make sure that your facts are, are on point and clear, so the message is clear across all platforms. About individuals in sport bringing about change, uh, we've spoken about the top. I wonder about the sport itself. Um, team GB, the most inclusive team at the Rio Olympics, 44 openly gay athletes. Um, also, of course, Susanna winning a, a gold medal, doing wonders for women's sport. Um, is elite success perhaps a key way to, to driving social change? Uh, it's a tricky question because you'd like, I, I would like to think, say no. I would like to say that the yes, that puts you more, people can talk about it, people are aware of it see people like me walking around almost being proud and um, women who have been successful standing on a podium it's, it's exceptional really in talking about their stories but I think the biggest impact that I've had and and I go back to yes okay we won an Olympic gold medal but it was only again it's been a, a big journey for me it's as a younger if I could talk to my younger self again what would I do I would say Susanna, don't laugh at the homophobic jokes that people say to you. Um, don't, when you hear a slightly racist comment, even though you're not sure it's, it's racist, say something. And these are all the things that I've actually thought about a lot more recently, actually, because we had a talk um, as a GB hockey player, players group um, from someone at the, the PFA, actually. 
And it was really interesting to listen to the perspective from football. And actually, my whole team was on this Zoom call. And I said to them, I need to tell you something. All of you actually, a lot of the time, are still homophobic to me every single day. And purely things like, Susanna, why do you look so gay today? And I'm like, I don't, I don't even know what gay looks like. And even me saying that to them, I've seen an immediate change. And, and that's why I say it like this, because none of them have said anything since. And, and all of them actually messaged me directly saying, I'm so sorry, Tana. And, and that's why I say, yes, success, of course, successful people, you, you, can, then, you can then implement it more and, and your power of like voice, it, it's, it's so much more powerful. And, but actually the small changes from the bottom are actually the biggest things that will make change. And, and I can't tell you walking around the Olympic Village, whether I felt gay or whatever I just felt like I was an athlete there playing in my sport and, and that's how everyone should feel but I think maybe I am an anomaly do I think someone's looking at me when I'm holding my girlfriend's hand walking down the street no did my ex-girlfriend worry and let go of my hand yes so absolutely every single person is different and with everything we're talking about it's how do you then have parity across everything that everyone is just there and that's what we're striving for but I, I do think we're a long way off unfortunately Thing, Eleanor. Susanna's there, I suppose, talking about to a degree is unconscious bias that perhaps people have. It's the little insidious things that we don't even realize that we do or say that can make people feel bad about themselves, that not want to progress. How do you deal with that? It's a narrative, isn't it? It's, it's something that people are used to growing up with. Um, you know, it's, it's all around them. And I think it's about challenging, challenging them when they're young at it. And, you know, um, for me, I'll, I'll use the example of um, the, the differences between male and female rugby players and, and sort of the differences in um, how our opportunities, how much we get paid, etc. When I'm working with boys and girls from the ages of sort of, you know, 12 to 16 or 18, and they're like, oh, well, you know, and they find out that I don't get paid to sort of play for Wales. And they're like, what? Why? Do, what, what do you mean you don't get paid? Like, what? But what um, you know, Dan Bigger or, or Gareth Anscombe, the equivalent to me in my position, well, they're on like hundred grand plus a year or whatever, whatever they're on. Um, and I'm like, well, why do you think I'm doing this job? Because I, I need a job to, to be able to com compete at an international level. So for them, it's really wrong and it's sexist. So at what age do we learn to be sexist, or you know, do we learn that this is actually it's it's sort of you know it's I know it's come from years and years ago, and I know it's sort of slowly, slowly changing, but people, don't, people aren't born to be homophobic, racist, sexist, or whatever. It is a narrative that we grow up around, and we have to start challenging that narrative. Leon, particularly with things like uh, Black Lives Matter, do you think that the initiatives we're seeing are breaking that down? I, I mentioned at the start with the introduction um, that sport has this, I don't know, from the outside looking in, this sort of it's fulfilling that potential that it's always had, that maybe, maybe this is the point, this is the tipping point. Am mm. I being overly optimistic? No, I mean, look, I, I, I think as, a, as somebody who campaigns around these issues, you know, when, when I stop being optimistic, I should just disappear and let other people step forward and, and, and take, take things forward. Because, you know, in the 20 years that I've been working in and around you know, diversity, it was called anti-racism in football and then it moved to diversity and has been called lots of different things um, over that journey. And actually that is progress in itself in terms of looking at the different areas of discrimination and actually having focuses and experts around those um, different areas. But, but things have progressed, but just in such a slow way and it's been deeply frustrating. Um, however, you know, 2005, a footballer called Mark Zorro decided to walk off the pitch in Italy, right? 2020, this week, a whole team, two teams decide to walk off the pitch. So, you know, is that progress? Well, it is progress because everybody walked off. If you look at the shots of Mark Zorro in 2005, his teammates are doing that. Don't walk off. Stay here. Samuel Eto'o the same, playing for Barcelona. Don't go off the pitch. Stay, stay, stay. Don't let the racists win. Well, you know, black players in, in, in this case and white players, all, all players have had enough. So, so now they're at, in terms of a tipping point to move things forward, we are moving things forward that way. 
Um, for me, this all comes down to, and I touched on it before, is, 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 is about accountability, responsibility, you know, who, 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 is the, who, who is responsible for protecting our athletes? Who is responsible for protecting the fans that come into the stadiums? Um, you know, those are the people that need to um, really step up here. And if you want to see what people care about in their lives, and, and everyone watching this can, can, can go and do this themselves. Go and have a look around your house. Go and look at what you spend your money on. Go and have a look in your fridge. You might see organic food, whatever it might be, right? It's an indicator of your values. Now, then look at your sport and then look at the money it spends and look at where it spends the money. It's the same principle. If you're spending a teeny bit of money on addressing racism in your sport, that's how much you care. That's how much you care. And that's the bit that needs to be addressed. And it might not be a matter of spending money. It might be a matter of where does this sit on the agenda for the CEO of your sport? If it sits in AOB, and I've been in so many meetings where you get to the end and they go, any other business? Yeah, well, we've had racist abuse and all sorts of stuff happen in sport. If it sits in AOB, forget it. You're not serious. This has got to be towards the top, if not at the very top of every agenda for every CEO in every sport going. And that includes the player associations as well. Um, if it's not there, then look, another 20 years, we can all come back. I'll be 61. Um, I'll be talking about the work that I've been trying to do. We'll have a bit more progress, but we won't be where we need to be. Fridge and what I spend my money on. Um, I'm going <laughs> to please ask questions. I'm going to start going through some of them now. But actually, what you pointed out there, Leon, is I mean, again, what we were talking about earlier of things ringing a little hollow when they're not quite sorted at the top, and you're expecting, you know, players, you're expecting fans, you're expecting all of this to be done, and when you can't sort it out the top. And Jed's got a really important point. Um, when many high-profile events are hosted in states with terrible human rights records, like Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Qatar, how much more difficult does this make it for athletes to affect change? Anton, this does it's, it smacks of a hypocrisy, doesn't it? When this money is flowing from from places where we've got terrible human rights records. Yeah, it is. It is, um, but. We gotta look. We gotta look closer to home. We gotta stay. We gotta sort out our own house before we start looking at other other places and other areas. You know, I believe it needs to be a collective approach. Um, the players, the clubs, the organisations, the federations. There's who is the actual mouthpiece to deal with diversity. Like when 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 something arises, is it kick it out? Is it the FA? Is it the Premier League? We don't know. There needs to be. It needs to be a collective thing. But one person had the power to, one organisation had the power to go and this is what we're doing and this is where it is. I think, but it comes together, you got to come together as a collective to do that. Right now, there's too many voices which then clouds um, the actual message, I think. And going back to last, going back to um, the Champions League game, it was a powerful, powerful thing that both teams came off. It was powerful. It shows unity, but then where's the unity at the top? There's too many. There's too many voices. Whereas on the pitch, players come together. This is what we're doing. We're going off. But then when you go to the top, there's one gun. No, it's okay. We they'll, they'll get over it. It's okay. There's one gun. This needs to be done. This what this is what we need to do. There's another one gun. Yeah, I agree with that. But I think we could do more of this. There needs to be clarity from the top, and it needs to be collective. But it's not even at the top, Anton. I mean, we had comments on Twitter from John Barnes that then sort of muddied the waters for people, perhaps. Yeah, and everyone's entitled to their own opinion. But when it is at the top, and, that, and you might not agree with their opinion, but when it comes from the top, and the top, and the top come together in this collective, and we start to see some type of change, like a lot of people probably didn't think that they would ever see in society, not just black people to, and ethnic minorities talking about racism. On the marches today, we see every every um, ethnic minority, every race on the march, you know? There's people that didn't agree with that, but now they do. They're, people will fall in line when they see something happening that's going to make change. Can I ask a question? What would be the, if there's one thing, so Eleanor, you probably get asked the same question. We, being gay, get asked what, what if, for example, there was a tournament in Russia, would you go? 
And it's a question actually I get asked a lot or a country where they, you, you literally can't be who you are. Is there anywhere or that you would feel or you felt Anton that you literally a country you couldn't go to or I don't know, let's say a stadium you couldn't go to because you didn't feel safe? Um, I've never experienced, I've never had that thought as an athlete. I never had that thought to go. I don't think I can go to that place, you know. Um, because even to put it into context, even being a gay woman, and this is how it still is, going to watch football, I would not go with my girlfriend and hold her hand. And, and that's why it actually goes back to being players, being athletes, being spectators and everything, where it's, it's feeling comfortable in a situation. And, and it, it just, it, it's just something that I find interesting because it's, there is so much racism in sport and actually in football going and homophobia and et cetera. And I think when you were a current athlete, it's good that you probably you felt still comfortable. Because um, I don't know how I would feel, for example, if I went to a country such as Russia and had to play. So it's it was just a question I was interested have in. Have you ever been put in that position, <laughs> Susanna? Have you ever been put in that position where you've had to morally question or you know worried about your health, but also your security, but also actually morally, do I want to be playing in this country? Have you ever been in that position? I haven't, but then that's the that's the question that I would ask myself morally, or ha but how do you then turn down playing for your country? And and that's where I don't know what my answer would be as an international athlete. How do you say no? I don't want to play. It's it's literally impossible. But I've never thankfully been in that situation. Um, I and I actually hand on heart don't know what I would do. <laughs> Eleanor, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Anton, just quick jump in, Eleanor. Yeah, we've had. Um... We had an annual tournament in seven, uh, a sevens tournament in uh, Russia. So we were in Moscow and then in Kazan. Um, and it just, the, the whole general feel of it wasn't um, great, but that there was loads of different reasons behind that and sort of the, the difference in facilities between, you know, there and then when we had the same tournament over in France, the second leg of it. Um, I never actually stopped to think that. I did think you do think, right, how are we act in? And you, and you do think, right, we need to act a little bit differently to how we might in the country. Um, but you, like you said, you would never really turn down the opportunity to play for your country. It's, it's very difficult to do that. Anton, sorry. Oh, say. Um, I was going to say, uh, um, alluding to what Susanna was saying, when playing, I'm, like, for instance, I'll use Chelsea as an example. When playing, I always felt, after the incident, I always knew I was going to be under the microscope when going there. But I was going there via a coach straight into the ground. No one really sees you. The only time I would get abuse or things held at me was when I stepped out of the tunnel onto the pitch. So you feel that level of protection. Yeah. You know, but when, if you say to me, Anton, that like for instance, Rio's, Rio says, oh, Anton, I'm playing at Stamford Bridge. You want to come and watch? That's a different kettle of fish. Do I feel safe enough to actually go to watch the game where I've got to walk among, amongst the fans to get into the into the into the stadium? I don't think I would have. Mm. Okay, I want to ask a couple more questions before we run out of time. Um, from people, uh, so we've got one here. The board reflecting the pitch wouldn't necessarily amount to diversity at leadership level. There is massive underrepresentation in football of British, Asian and minority ethnics, as well as LGBTQ plus individuals and in the women's game from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds. Will we need to look outside of sport to relieve the pressure faced by current and ex-players like Anton to drive change, to educate on and off the pitch? Which external bodies could be influential? Leon? Yeah, well, I mean, um, I think it's an excellent point. Um, well made because we do have um, underrepresentation of lots of um, groups, particularly British Asian groups in professional football. Um, it's an ongoing discussion which probably isn't as um, visible as it as it needs to be in, in football. Um, I think it comes up every now and then, but you know it's a common thing that we say, oh, it's complete meritocracy on the pitch. Well, actually, if the, for the British Asian community, that's not reflected in what we're seeing. Um, in terms of professional athletes. And I think we need to kind of have a big um, discussion around that. Um, so in terms of like the board level, um, I know Anton mentioned that, that course earlier on. I'm actually one of the founders of that course. So I'm glad to know that you're on it um, because I think that is something that should happen more across all sports. Essentially, it's a corporate governance course 
um, to help um, athletes, former athletes, in this case footballers, um, get an understanding of what it would take to be on a board and, move, and come away with a qualification to be able to say to a board across sport, um, I'm, I'm board ready, I, I can actually take a position. Um, I think the point made um, in the questions was, was around, do we need to also look outside of mm -hmm. um, former players and athletes? Yes, absolutely, because that's what you would do if you're looking to appoint a white person. You wouldn't just go, right, what white former players do I know? Let me have a think about that. You would go, oh, right, okay, well, what, what, what skill set do we want for this board? Okay, and a lot of the time, a lot of these sports boards, by the way, are desperately crying out for, for athletes and former athletes and that knowledge. But if you were looking for somebody with skills from the city, it's not hard to go and find a black person from the city who is really interested in football and would add a lot because you can definitely do that for a white person. So for me, the frustration lies that in, in the fact that when we're looking for people, for boards, for executive teams across sport, um, we don't do that. We don't look for um, people who bring a different diversity um, outside of our own sport, um, but we do it for white people. So that for me needs to be like addressed urgently because there are plenty of incredibly bright sharp people working across lots of different sectors who would kill i don't know what it's like for you guys but anytime i go to my friends they just want to talk about sport and my job all the time right it, it gets boring i want to know about them so they're they're desperate to work in our industry um many of them you know black and asian from oxford cambridge if that's the the marker that people need and i don't necessarily agree with that by the way but if that's what sport is saying that we need people of that level of education to sit in certain positions, they exist. We just aren't very good at looking for them because we don't take deliberate actions to address the problems that we have in our sport. Do we want them? Do we want them though? Do, that's the sorry, um, do, Leon. Do, do do we want them? Because as you say, they're out there. But do we want them at that at that level? Do we do the people at board level want someone with experience in what they're talking about? You know that that's. Yeah. That's, I think that's the, that, that's where the problem lies. And mm. answering that que answering that question um, that was put that was posed to us, the reason why I say the board level has to mirror the um, what's on the field and the diversity on the field is because, for instance, the Premier League has different races, different um, people from different countries. So we, I say um, Indian. Chinese, there's um, Afro-Caribbean, there's, there's white, there's, there's um, Eastern European in there. At board level, these people should have a voice up there. They should be able to look at, at the board and go, I know someone's actually up there speaking for me. And I think this is where we need to be careful. Is, is The reason why I think we need to be careful is because that person that goes in at board level needs to be it can't you, do, you can't just go there because of your ethnicity or because of where you come from it has to be the right person someone who and for me talking for, uh, um talking from my background it has to be someone who ain't gonna go in there and there's a difference between challenging someone's authority and challenging someone to be better you know and i think the balance needs to be right and when we're going in there let's challenge people to be better and i'll use the fa as an example when you go in there as, as a, someone working around the chairman and I, uh, Greg Clark got relieved of his duties for using the term coloured, right? And if he was around the right, we're not, I'm not saying he's not the right person for the job, but if he, was, if he was the right person for the job and he was open to having diversity around him, there's no chance that he's going on that TV and speaking the way that he is because the right person that's working around him is pulling him up and they're going to be saying to him, Listen, Greg, you can't speak like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Um, I've got two questions. It's sort of linked to that. It's, it's around about where that, how you get pathways, I suppose, from the bottom up to the top, as it were, to get more diversity in there. Because we can look outside, but we're not getting it right within, within football, within other sports. So Ian says, I agree with the government should take responsibility, but shouldn't we be educating from the bottom up as well so we're producing better people to fill these high profile roles in the future? Is that a problem? Also, Anonymous, working in an organization brackets, Premier League football club, who are very outward in their statements, campaigns in this area, 
but the evidence doesn't within doesn't reflect that, I find myself gathering like-minded people around me to bring about change undercover in a strategic way. How can we effectively challenge the hierarchy directly as well? Fantastic documentary, by the way, Anton. Um, Susanna, do you want to take some of those? I think if you start from, if you do start from the bottom, it's how, let's even say like the Women's World Cup, like the Lionesses, for example, think about women's sport. You've got women scoring on TV, people watching. You've then got a young boy, this is in very simple terms, a young boy, two months later, kicking a ball in the garden, saying, shouting bronze, it's Lucy Bronze's name. Like that's where stuff starts, where people start to see things and have role models. And I, the reason I say that is because notoriously you say they're looking at um, David Beckham or shouting a male counterpart name, whereas the difference is, and what's starting to happen is, these young kids are having role models where whatever color, whatever color they are, wherever they've come from, whatever background they have, whatever their sexual orientation, it doesn't matter. They see them for what they're good at and what they're supported and who they want to be. And, and that's why if you really simplify it, it literally is us having and youngsters having these role models. And then it gets brought up and, and kids are, tend to be quite simple in that in those terms. They, they see something, they like it, they want to be it. And I think if you look at the education from schools, which they're starting to have, if you look at our sports such as hockey, which are going back into grassroots, which are having talks with under 16s, 18s, 21 seniors, and it's across the whole board where everyone is on a very similar page and everyone's having very open and honest conversations. And if you think, if I, even if I think of my parents and, and the backgrounds they've had, people for years and years have been using different terms and and saying the wrong thing, right thing. And, and actually people don't really know what the right thing to say is anymore a lot of the time because everyone's so scared of making mistakes. And the bit we need to get to is that people can make a mistake as such by saying it. It's not a mistake, it's actually, that's not the right thing you're saying, say that. And then people learn. And, and we're not at that point yet because openly everyone is so scared to say things in case they do get it wrong. And, and I think that's why the whole world really needs to have a lot more open conversations about these things where we can be honest, we can be authentic. You can have young boys, young girls having role models from absolutely anywhere. And, and that's where it starts. And, and personally, from a very personal point of view, I do see that starting. And, and if I think of one thing that I can do to help create that change, those are the little conversations that I'm having. And hopefully by having that, even for example, with my mum, she can then have that conversation with others. And and it's a small, tiny stepping stone to get somewhere, but it is certainly a start. Is that it, Eleanor? You spoke about the narrative. Is it just about the way we talk? And, and to that degree, how useful or not is social media in, in shutting down some debates? Actually, we need to open them up more. Yeah, I think just going back to the bottom up thing just quickly is, is everyone goes through, most people go through an education and go through school. So that is everything, you know, you learn so much from your schooling. And, um, I think a lot of the curriculum now is probably reflective of where we were 20, 30 years ago and hasn't updated yet to where we are currently. And an example of that is, is one girl, 13 year old girl I work with, um, challenged uh, a year seven curriculum that her sister had, had become quite upset at. And it was, it was how Africa was portrayed and it was portrayed with mud huts. And she was like, but that doesn't reflect my home country. Um, you know, and she really challenged this, the, the science teachers on that and, and the school on that. But it was like how the school are reacting to that. And, and now, because she's challenged it, now they're changing the representation of Africa within the curriculum. And it shouldn't really take that to happen. It should be updated all the time. I know teachers have got, you know, a lot on their plates as it is, but, it, but it's, it's the curriculum and it's come from the government. And I think we have to look at that and we have to update it. Um, but it shows where we're going to that students are now challenging their curriculum okay we're running out of time but before i let everyone go i'd love to get your own individual thoughts a sort of progress uh, for the future you know how far away from the ideal of what you would like to see in british sport how it can be used as this vehicle for social change where the improvements can be made and what role sports has in in making that change lots in that but i'm sure you'll dig out whatever it is that you want to take from it where do you need to where do you want us to be leon yeah for, for, for me i guess there's 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 two things um you know we, we, we probably we really need to get a proper understanding 
of what we're saying when we're saying we want a diverse leadership across our sport. Because diverse also means white middle class man, you know. And I think at the moment, a lot of people look at diversity and then think that's um, five black people sat around a table. It's not. Diversity is absolutely every single one of us. We all contribute to that. And I use a, a sporting analogy now, and it's going to come from football. So apologies to, to the people who aren't really on football. Um, if you had a team of people, all, all who played with left foot and all were defenders, how would your team do? It has no diversity, right? <laughs> so you need some right footers in there. You need people who have two feet. You need someone who's quick. You need all of that contributes to what makes a team. And in terms of that push and pull, the understanding of everybody, that's what we need at the very top of our sport. The second point I want to make is um, we all have a responsibility, you know, each and every one of us. Don't think this is somebody else's problem. You know, we can all make differences in our life in some kind of way. You know, it might be how we educate our kids. It might be how we are asking questions of governing bodies. Um, it might be how we're talking to our teammates and how we decide to pull them up. Um, we need to do all of those things. We have responsibility, each and every one of us, um, to make the change. And if, and if we get serious change at the top, as Anton says, the, 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 the fish's head won't, start, won't rot. <laughs> and then we're going to have a healthy fish that can kind of go and, and do its swimming or whatever it does um, to make sure that our sport is as healthy as it, as it can be. Anton, to you. Yeah, I think there's a saying. I think we, we need to continue these um, uncomfortable, uncomfortable conversations. And I think there's a saying, as an athlete, uh, when you're trying to get fit, the quickest for you to get fit is to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Mm. And I think the guys at the top need to get comfortable being involved in an uncomfortable conversation. Mm. And I think the quicker that that happens, we will start to see change. I would like to see people, I'd like to see them leaning on and getting experiences, getting the words of people that have experienced racism. It doesn't have to be me. I'm not sitting here saying it has to be me, but there's not just me that's experienced racism, but get the experiences from, from us because it's down, for, it's down to people like myself and Leon and other, and other players and other people to share our experiences because some people, are nev they're never going to feel the way that we, we felt around it happening. They're not going to understand how it feels, but they can be open-minded and understand what it is that we've been through. So there's a difference. And when they start to do that, that's when change can start to happen. And that's why in the documentary, I didn't want what documentaries I've, I've watched before on, on racism in sport, where it's just black people talking about racism. That's not racism. Everyone needs to talk about racism. For it to get better, everybody has to talk about it. So we can't hear you. Zana, uh, you, where, um, where do we need to be? How in very, very simple terms, really, there don't need to be these huge catalysts for people to react. And again, boards to become more diverse and everyone panics because they haven't got it. It's, you want it to be that it, it's there and it's, it's not going to be overnight, but it, it will start to change. And, and as Leon and Anton have just alluded to, it's the, it's the open and honest conversations that, that people are uncomfortable having yet have to have. And, and I think then in time change will happen, but it can't just be everyone resting on their laurels thinking it will. And the people that maybe think that they're not affected by anything, again, like, like it's been mentioned, everyone is. And to open our eyes a bit more and actually see what's happening and speak up and and be a voice for people that maybe are being affected by things because actually ultimately everyone is and in a roundabout way so i think keep on doing what everyone is starting to do and and be uncomfortable doing it very good eleanor yeah for me just there's two things it's visibility is the first thing um you know that is just crucial across the board um, let's make everything that comes out in the media and, and the governing bodies put out, let's make sure it's representative of everyone who plays the sport or everyone, or just everyone, the whole population, because then we can encourage more to play the sport. And, and it's just, you know, if people can see it, then they know they can be it. So, you know, that, that really is the case. And then the second thing is equal opportunity. I, I really want it to, that we get to the point where a 15 year old person, no matter what their gender, age, race, background, whatever, any of that, they can have the same aspirations, no matter who they are. Um, and yeah, that's it for me.
<laughs> Excellent. Before I end, just two comments here in the chat. Um, agree with Leon. Uh, Anton, you were hard on yourself and we are so grateful for you shining a light. And from Charlie, love what Susanna has just said. There's a danger of people being scared to talk about racism and diversity for fear of saying the wrong thing. We can only impact on behaviours when we understand how others think and speak. And to Lynn, thank you all and keep going. Hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Uh, everybody, Susanna, Eleanor, Leon and Anton, and to everybody who joined, thank you so much for being part of this debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye now. Yes.